Great outfit, man. <laughs> I, I got to start there. On a serious note, let's get back to the note. Um, you're seeing a lot of, of upside for tech in Q4. You actually believe that tech can move another 10% in Q4. What's the catalyst? I mean, look, this is our second trip in Asia in the last six weeks. Demands outstripping supply 15 to 1. So even though right now it starts with Godfather of AI, Jensen, NVIDIA, this second, third, fourth derivative, it's just starting to play out in terms of AI. I think that is going to be the catalyst to tech stocks being up 10% plus this year, 20% next year. I think the AI party, still 9 p.m. with the party that doesn't <laughs> end till 4 a.m. Why does the party end at 4 a.m.? I, I mean, I don't even, I, this metaphor always cracks me up every time you do it. Uh, but on a serious note, you're saying demand is up. That's what's going to push the tech sector 10% more in Q4. Demand exactly for what? For chatbots, um, for chips? I mean, what is the real catalyst here? I mean, I, if I look from a chip demand, 15 to 1 demand to supply. So if you see how it's all playing out, enterprises are lining up in terms of the AI revolution. Now, now we're just going to start to see the software, the use cases. That's where Messi of AI, Palantir, front and center. You look at names like Oracle, what I believe Salesforce.com, ServiceNow. So now that tidal wave of spend, a trillion dollars of AI capex is coming to the shores of tech but in the, to me in the next two or three years. By the way, I interviewed Alex Carp a few weeks ago. We talked about you. We talked about you and some of your notes. He, he's a fan. He's a fan. Um, I want to get to some more of your note. Uh, according to your note, for every dollar spent on NVIDIA chips, there's an 8 to $10 spend in the tech sector. So I want to drill down on that. Is it in the tech sector or is it on AI capabilities? Because we just talked about uh, mm -hmm. utilities having their best uh, quarter, excuse me, since back in 2003. Isn't a lot of this spending on, on just physical infrastructure? Is that technically tech spending? Sure. I think 8 to 10 is going to be from software, infrastructure. You talk about the energy piece. It speaks to our view that it's not just about NVIDIA. It's not just about Microsoft. It's now about the multiplier. So what you're going to see really across software, I think the big catalyst going to tech over the next 12, 18 months, numbers are going to go up, I think, 15, 20% across the tech sector. And I think that's why a lot of the bears that are continue being those caves in hibernation modes, they come out talking about valuation. I think streets underestimating growth. That's why, in my opinion, this tech bull market Still in the second inning. I got to be fair, though, Dan. You are one of the biggest bulls when it comes to tech overall. So you're always optimistic, in all fairness. But let's just talk about scale. Me and you have talked for many years. There have been times where maybe there was some caution, mm -hmm. where you could see some risk. But right now, in terms of just fundamentally what we see, we see it across the board, not just in Asia, but around the world. Enterprises are lining up, and I think that's why it's about the next phases now of tech playing out in terms of okay. this AI revolution. All right, I want to talk about two different uh, ETFs, the IGV, the software ETF, also the CIBR, cybersecurity. Those are two ETFs. A lot of investors I talk to, they say to look at those. Um, are we going to see these gains you're talking about for the tech sector in these two areas? Oh, I think that's really front and center because when you talk about use cases, it's about software, not just on names like Palantir and others, ServiceNow, Salesforce, I think the rest of tech, we'll give you look at names like Adobe and others, and then you think about how you're going to protect that. Cybersecurity, that's where names like Zscaler, CrowdStrike, 1995 moment in tech, almost 1996, but it's not a 1999 yeah. bubble moment. So IGV, CIBR, both up about 10% year to date. Where do they finish the year? If you think tech rises another 10%, what about these two specific areas? 15 to 20%. I think these are, these are specifically areas where I think you have just a huge parabolic run into year-end given numbers. So those two rise another 5%, but the tech sector 10%. Oh, yeah, I think because I think we're, you're really going to see MAG7. Okay. Big tech's going to continue leading this left lane going 90 miles an hour. Unprecedented types of promotion from especially U.S. carriers. The rise in at and Rise in at and T-Mobile. Just because this is the time. In other words, when you think about 5G, when that came out, and now essentially AI, this is really going to be the opportunity in terms of carrier discounts. And what really starts, you talk about maturity on a smartphone cycle. This is now that consumer AI revolution that actually will go through Cupertino. And we think that's how we have a $4 trillion mark cap as we you know, go into early next year. Do you have some of the parts on Apple you can update for Yeah, so right we have $1.7 is what, what I view as the services value. And, and when you sort of some of the parts that... That's something where you know you got about 100 billion of rev growing mid teens, free cash flow margins are double the hardware business. You combine it, it's over four trillion. I think bull case is ultimately you know over th over 300.
All right, listen up. You'll have the chance to visit the CNBC studios. This is a rare opportunity with only 20 spots available. You'll also get a quick one-on-one -on -one chat with me to discuss your financial future. The event will take place on the 10th of October, so reserve your spot now before it's gone. It does take us to our talk of the tape. How much more can stocks rise? Let's ask Tom Lee. He's Fundstrat's head of research and CNBC contributor, live with us once again at Post 9. Nice to see you. Great to see you, Scott. You know, since the Fed did their jumbo cut, the market really hasn't done all that much except for one day last Thursday. Why? Uh, well, you know, I think the Fed unleashed uh, us on an easing cycle, and that's going to be positive. We know it's actually historically positive three months, six months out. But what stocks do in the next month is a bit of a coin flip, and I think that's what we're seeing because there's some repositioning that took place. And also we're now thinking about the 40 days into the election. So does the fact that the election is but 40 days away sort of ruin the perfect scenario for stocks to get that post-Fed bump? I, I think it delays it. Um, just because, uh, you know, in, in the conferences that I've been speaking, to, speaking at and seeing wealth managers and family offices, a lot don't want to commit capital until after Election Day. And it, I don't think it matters who wins. It's just they want to get that event behind them. Oh, so you think we're going to have sort of a dash to the finish uh, after Election Day is, is out of the way? Yeah, and that's pretty typical. You know, in fact, uh, in, in election years, the November-December rallies are pretty tremendous. And in fact, when markets are up more than 10 percent in the first half, you also get big rallies November-December sort of choppy through September. You think investors are sold on the idea that this economy is going to make it, it's going to make it through, the Fed's going to pull this off? Is any of what we've witnessed since Fed Day doubts about the bigger picture? Uh, so far, so good. This Friday, we get core PCE, and hopefully that confirms inflation is no longer on the front burner. But I'd say one thing I've noticed is that the number of investors and professional money managers that think we're already in a recession is very high. And so I think the evidence just has to be better than expected. And I think those views shift back to soft landing. When we've seen, you know, recently targets for the S&P, Brian Belsky, I keep bringing him up because he's the most recent to raise his target up to the highest now on the street. I've asked you about, you know, the market lately. You haven't sounded like you, you'd be raising your own target to a degree like that, would you? Uh, you know, I... I think there is a lot of upside in the foreseeable future, let's say three, six months out. But for someone to tactically say, we need to pin a 6,000 target and then put money to work today, I think it's harder to make that case because valuations um, aren't on the cheaper end and we've already had a, a fairly sizable move. So I'm not saying I'm like bearish right now, but to me, uh, I'm, I'd have a lot more confidence saying three, six months out, things are attractive, especially things went like margin debt, right? It's it actually decreased in August, meaning investors have been deleveraging. Mm -hmm. It hasn't gone anywhere for the last four months at a time when markets are rising. I guess, I guess my point would be it would have been better articulated to just say you don't sound as bullish as you usually are. Is that fair? Uh, you know, yes, I'm, I'm bullish into year end, but I'm, I'm a little less confident about how we how markets behave into Election Day. And that, not that I think we're going to have a huge drawdown. Um, if we do have a big drawdown, you know, I'd be buying that dip. But I, I also don't think we can make new highs and then and then see the market blast off after Election Day. So I'd rather sort of say things look a lot better after Election Day. Can we make new highs if, if tech doesn't resume its leadership role in anywhere close to the degree that it had? Um, as long as tech is a market perform, if tech actually declines, that's going to be hard for the rest of the S&P 500 to compensate. But what we've seen so far, including the days like NVIDIA and Tesla recently, is that, it, that tech is actually holding its own, but other stocks are starting to show uh, catalysts and signs of life. Yeah. What about the broadening trade? I mean, look, you look at the Russell, your big call, uh, of course, week to date, it's down more than 1%. Really hasn't done much at all. I, I kept hearing, hey, you got to wait till the Fed cuts. Then you go into the Russell. I don't know. What do you think? Well, Russell had a big week last week. Uh, it's some profit taking now, but I, I think that there's, you know, this is what bottoms look like. Um, I don't think bottoms are straight up. I know in 2021, energy was bottoming and it was also very choppy, but eventually made 
not only new highs, but then basically had a blistering gain in 2020 in the year following. So I think that's a multi-year start for the Russell. It feels choppy, but we're still near all-time highs. And there's a, there's a big fundamental case to own small caps. Some have made the case that there are a lot of areas of the market that are overcrowded at this point. So many different sectors have gone up a bunch. You look at industrials and utilities and other things that have traded near or at highs. Therefore, they find better uh, value in bonds. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think a bond investor is buying a bond different for a different reason than buying an equity. <clears throat> because an equity gives you not only inflation protection uh, and benefit from falling yields, but also capital appreciation and positive surprise. Bonds rarely give you positive surprise. I think a bond investor uh, should, I mean, someone should have some income with some capital upside there, but there are so many good opportunities. And, you know, the fact that China has started to actually perform better and potentially broken out, that's, again, a, a breadth signal because that's, a, that's been a big drag for the last few years. Oh, how about that? Do, do you feel like the move that happened in China this week is a game changer on how we should view what, you know, the potential turn in their economy means? For the overall markets, I mean, we've seen certain stocks get a nice boost. Some of the luxury goods companies, right? LVMH, Estee Lauder, et cetera. And the gaming stocks. What about in the bigger of... picture? Uh, you know, it's hard to tell what's a trading rally versus a bottom for China. Uh, I spent some time talking to Mark Newton, our technical strategist. He thinks this is a bona fide breakout. And it is coming on the heels of not only stimulus, but in the face of unrelenting bad news for China. So to me, a rally on bad news is a sign that maybe the worst is already priced into China, and that means it could rally for a while. All right. All right, listen up. You'll have the chance to visit the CNBC studios. This is a rare opportunity with only 20 spots available. You'll also get a quick one-on-one -on -one chat with me to discuss your financial future. The event will take place on the 10th of October, so reserve your spot now before it's gone.